Okay, hello everybody. It's starting to, people are starting to stream in. Salam Hamegi. Uh, Salam Be Hamegi. I'm Leila. This is my dear friend Omid. Hello, um, everyone. Also known as the Caspian Chef. So, this is a little different than what we planned. We planned to have a Zoom where we could see all of your faces, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of people signed up. I think we're at, we're at almost 400 right now. <laughs> um, which a lot of people I know are in Europe. So it's a different, different time zone. Uh, we'll see how many people can make it. They said that they were going to watch the replay, um, but we had to switch it to a webinar. So it's just the two of us talking, but we'll see you all in the chat. So right now, let me make sure that we can see, um, everyone can see the messages. Who can see your messages? Recording is on so everyone in the meeting can see and send. So can you all send a message to us right now in the chat? and let us know uh, where you are calling from and just say hello in the chat so we know that it's working. Because that's actually one thing that sometimes it's not on the correct setting. Might not be right now. Yeah, I don't I see any know. chat yet. I think that, okay, here we go. Panels can chat with everyone and attendees can chat with everyone. Okay, here we go, everybody. Let me know in the chat, say hello and say where you're calling from. Ariana says, yay. Uh. <laughs> Wonderful. Salon Leila, Salon from New Zealand. What time is it in New Zealand, Amy? Hajar is in Algeria, a familiar, yes. familiar uh, person in Canada. Uh, and then PEI, Manali, Salon Manali, John. London. Uh, yeah. Israel, Salon. So, Israel, uh, so Bar Haim, you've already made your Puerto Rican <laughs> I already posted it on our stories. And actually, so. Um, this idea was kind of inspired by Sami Nostrat's big lasagna day. Uh, she did a big lasagna day where she put the recipe. Did you see that, Omidjan? I did, yes. Okay. So she put the recipe in the New York Times, and then she invited everybody to cook a lasagna all together. And so everyone hashtagged it and everything. So I would love for us to be able to do this. When you make your photo shakaras, tag me and the Caspian chef, and let's see your beautiful creations. Yes. Yeah, and so I'm calling from in Dallas and uh, where else are we calling? Canada, lots of Canada, Arizona, Netherlands, London. Wow. <laughs> and uh, Polly says uh, she's already done her footage and it's in the fridge. Yes, and she said, wow. and Polly, how old is your son? She said that she has to make it in a way that hides the vegetables or she has to give him the, <laughs> the meat on its side. So how old is your son? Tell us so that we can... <laughs> See what, he's grown up. Yeah, yeah. He's a grown up. Oh. <laughs> if you have to hide the vegetables from the grown up, we got bigger problems. <laughs> well, hopefully he'll like the Horish cat ups. So let us know how he likes it. And um, and Sunaina has made his Horish too with the recipe. So wonderful on a cold night. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I have my cup of chai and uh, Omid has his cup of chai as well. And yes. I have all of my ingredients here, I'm uh, about to start cooking in a little bit, but uh, I thought we'd just start the discussion. So uh, a lot of you are new to Persian cooking, or you've done this dish a lot of times before, but I thought it was a good one to start with because uh, it's very quintessentially Iranian. It's very unique. Celery is the main ingredient, and yes. it's using ingredients that we all have in our kitchen. So Omi John, can you tell us a bit about this dish in general? Absolutely. I mean, this this dish is, uh, is classified as what we call koresh, which is its own section of various stews and braises, which, which ultimately what it means is there's some form of meat that is cooked with onion. Inevitably, there's some turmeric in there. And Iranian stews are just take time. There is no quick um, turnaround unless if you maybe use a pressure cooker to soften the meat. Often what I tell folks is that serving tough meat is as good as committing crime in, <laughs> in Persian cuisine. Because when you think about it, Iranians, if you're right-handed, you hold a spoon in your right hand and a fork in your left hand. So the meat needs to be so cooked so tenderly so that you can literally tear it apart. So that's that's what we're trying to do with this khuresh. The meat needs to get cooked. So. Traditionally, you always start with the onion. You give it a nice uh, saute, which in Farsi is taft dadan, to saute. Dodan. So 
uh, because this is a language learning uh, thing, I, I want us all to repeat the word. If Omid says a word in Farsi, let's all repeat it together. So, taft dodan. Yes, to Perfect. give it a saute is literally, it probably translates to. So, you saute the onion and then you do another very quintessentially Iranian thing and that you always color the onions with turmeric. And turmeric is zard chube. Zar chube. So I have that here. It's a beautiful color. And if it gets on your hands, it definitely stains or anywhere. Yeah. So zar so, chube. The reason we use zar chube or turmeric so much is because there is not only we love the color of, uh, of the turmeric itself, but also Iranians have such an aversion to the scent of the meat that zar chube is the remedy to take that raw scent out of the meat. So um, in Farsi, in Persian, we say uh, and every time you say that term, you make a face that <laughs> translates to that scent that is about the gaminess of the meat, that the, the scent of a raw meat and our remedy, <laughs> right. And so Zad Chube, turmeric takes that scent out or so the, the, the legend had it. So we always saute the onion, add the turmeric, and then you layer in the rest of ingredients. In this case, the meat needs to get blended in with the onions and get coated with the turmeric. And then once it no longer looks raw, this is not about completely cooking it at all. This is about just coating it with the oil and the turmeric, taking the redness of the meat out, and then you cover it with water and you cook it on its own. Then we switch to cooking this, the, the star in this case, and I know, bear with me, the star is the celery tonight. Uh, <laughs> cook the celery with the fresh herbs and then the, the whole thing gets integrated with your salt, pepper, and some form of acid. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Right, so, and I, I wanna uh, stop just a second. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat since we can't, See you guys, I want to just mention. So Mondendi is saying so many don't know what else they can do with celery other than raw dips and soups. I love this dish so much, which gives cat offs a whole new life. And I completely agree. And everyone's yes. saying that they're learning so much already. And <laughs> that I wanted to point out, so we have a lot of uh, people who don't traditionally eat Iranian food on this call. Um, the spoon wow. comment is very interesting. So I grew up you know, eating Iranian food. And I didn't know that it's strange to have a spoon at the table. You know, when I first, you know, I'm I married to an American. And so he was always very surprised of why I put a spoon for, with every dish. They only put spoons for soups and things. So these are these cultural differences that you don't really recognize unless you step out of it and come back in. So what you said, like we eat meat with a spoon. I've never eaten meat with a fork. That was right. So I and appreciate that you point that out. Yeah, and and unless if you're eating a steak, if you come to somebody's home and if you ask for a knife, oh, that's just that tells you everything you need to know about how not so well you've done. <laughs> you've right. done. So the, again, the the notion is the meat needs to be exceptionally tender. Right. So I just added my olive oil, uh, rogan zeytun. Rogan zeytun. <laughs> and uh, uh, someone my... asked if I'm going to, yes, I will write out all these ingredients um, in Persian and uh, you'll be able to learn it all. Beautiful. Beautiful. So I'm going to saute my onion for just a few minutes, then add my turmeric. All right. And then move on. So what stage are you in? Uh, I am right there time. too. I haven't turned my, turned the heat on, on my onions. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be there too. But yeah, we'll, we'll continue the conversation as we're, as we're clicking. And um, I think that if you all, anyone who's watching, if you want to try to cook it along with us, or if you want to cook this afterwards, however you want to do it, it's five o'clock in Texas. So it's a little late. How long is the whole process of this dish? So you saute the onion and the beef, that takes about 10 minutes, and then you, uh, you add water and it cooks for half hour. That half hour, then you have time to cook the celery and the herbs. 
and that takes about 15, 20 minutes. So after everything got assembled, then we cook it for another 60, 70 minutes. Now, the time obviously will vary depending on the size of the beef, the way you have cut it. So for this dish, it isn't traditional to cut the meat too small. Obviously, it's not too chunky, but it is, I'd say a good inch or so is about the relevant appropriate size for the stew and meat. Whereas I made another uh, dish earlier today for that dish, which is Khoresh Qayme. It's uh, beef cooked with yellow split peas and a tomato sauce with crispy fries on top. That is one of my favorites. <laughs> yes. With that one, you can't have the meat to be too big. For that one, the meat needs to be almost like half inch size. So also, uh, let me ask. So there's some vegetarians who asked if this is possible to cook it without um, meat and I know you also used to cook a lot of vegetarian do absolutely a lot of vegetarian. so yeah, was, what, is, what is your suggestion just leave absolutely. it absolutely you can totally leave it out obviously that's one easy thing to do right um and I'm always you know leaving it out is one thing but also adding a substitution perhaps is a better thing yes and when you start substituting obviously you're veering away from what was traditional so for as far as I'm concerned, anything goes, anything that you like put in there. So when I was a veg, I was a vegetarian for about 20 years. And so when I would make Persian stews, I would reach to whatever source of protein that spoke to me. Mm -hmm. I love chickpeas and I would have put chickpeas in there. Again, not traditional. Don't, don't, don't quote me on all of these. <laughs> not traditional. Um, and veering off even further out of tradition, I love tofu, I love tempeh, I love seitan, which is a wheat-based gluten. Okay. And particularly seitan can be very meat look-alike and chewy. That gives a really good texture and um, mouthfeel as a substitute. So those are some of the maybe, options. Maybe mushrooms, would that work? Or Absolutely. red beans? Someone said red Absolutely. beans. Absolutely. Okay. Red beans. Um, Red beans will take it a little closer to the uh, sabzi route, which is perfect, right? Which is absolutely perfect. Again, we're veering off the tradition. You're opening it up to what, you know, I always think, what do I have on hand in the kitchen? That is probably the best source of protein, right? <laughs> so if I don't have to go to the store and or shop for something, then I'll just reach in the pantry and whatever I have, that's probably the best thing. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm going to take a minute to put my my uh, piaz in. <laughs> and, so, yeah, go ahead. My piaz is doing well. It is looking like a really good piaz sorg shode, sorg kharde. Sorg shode, okay, sorg is the color red. So sorg shode to red or to fry. Yes. So another word we use to, um, to define uh, saute is taft dodan. Taft dodan. So we're taft, tafting, well, I'm mixing Farsi and, and, and English here. Tafting is, is not a word, but I, I, <laughs> taft dodan is to, the act of sauteing. And mine looks, I'll bring it a little closer every once in a while so you get to see. It's looking nice and lightly golden. I want to just go a little further before I add my turmeric to it. Okay. But let me show you. And I'm it's always, oh yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say it's always tricking, tricky lifting the lid, um, tilting the pan sideways to bring it to the camera right. and not spilling the food. Oh wow, okay. So, so it's starting to look a lightly golden color, but I want to go a little bit more before <laughs> I add my turmeric. So it should be almost translucent. It should go on the other side of translucent. Okay. Yeah, just a little color, just a little color. Okay. So piaz is so quintessential in Iranian cuisine. Yes. Many families, including myself, given how, you know, this is like to take 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes what I do is I actually cook a large batch of onions, mm -hmm. add my turmeric to it, and then I keep it in the refrigerator. So when I come home, and it's later at nighttime and I'm wanting to get it stew started. At least I've saved myself that 15 minutes. I'll just reach in the, in the fridge, get my piaz sorg shode, 
<laughs> fried onions, and then I will start from there. So it's a 15 minute time saver. Great tip. <laughs> and I want right. to, yeah, I want to talk about batch cooking too, because that's something that I am not very good at. The what cooking? Batch cooking. So batch cook. Cook, yeah. like if I wanted to make, is it just as easy as doubling all the ingredients if I want to make twice as much as this? Yes, I think going up to twice or three times or four times, you would you would do it very literally. Wow. But um, I literally just had a dinner serving 80 people. Uh, you don't then just times 80. You really got to adjust. Someone who knows what they're doing really needs to look at that wow. and then score that accordingly. So, uh, but most of us aren't going to be cooking for 80 <laughs> people. Maybe maybe we'll have guests come over and we'll double it up, right? Do, In you, which do, case that? do you do that and then freeze food or are you cooking so much that you don't need to do that? For what? Like in general, when you're cooking a choresh, since oh. it takes so much time, do you make more and freeze some? Or do you just... I, I love leftovers. I know some people um, don't care much for the leftover. I I can eat the same thing over and over and over. I'll just, one day I'll have it with bread, next day with rice, next day with a salad. So I, I'm okay with it. Um, so there's always... Um, an opportunity to have a lazy day and having had cooked it ahead of time. Right, right. Wonderful. So that chube time for me. So I'm gonna add my turmeric. Okay. <laughs> and when is that chube time? We have to wait until it's translucent. Yes. Okay. Yes. So get get your onions nice and translucent and just a slight color into them. Then add your zarchube. Toast it for a couple of minutes. It really seeps into the onion. Every center, every piece of the onion should be golden. Then you add your beef. Wonderful. I think I'm yeah. ready to do Yeah, there's just something so aromatic and magical about this uh, turmeric that every time you add it in, I'm still in awe of that transformation and that scent that emanates from, from Zad Chube. Right. So really nice. I wish this is what wine looks like at this stage. Wow, okay, wonderful. So I know I some of you- I don't feel as confident doing that, so I'm not going to, but mine looks okay. just like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and I'm going to take a second to look at the, um, the comments in case I missed anything. Oh, Fana's is here. Fana's, if you can help me with comments, <laughs> it's, if, if there's anything that needs to be answered. So is that chube uh, because Zad means yellow? Is that right? Yes. yes. And chube is a reference to, you know, when you look at the turmeric root, it looks like ginger, except it's completely yellow on the inside. So it, it, it literal translation is yellow wood. That's what Zach Chuba translates to, or little small wood. Gotcha. Too big, right? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and then yeah. I also want to ask you about the um, concept of uh, dam keshu dan, like when the no, what is it when uh, or jolfta dan jolfta dan? Yes, that dam keshu dan is for rice. Right. Jolf Dodan, that's okay. Jolf Dodan is for stews. So let me put my beef in there. So as I talk, at least it's happening in the background. And then I'll tell you about Jolf Dodan. So Jolf Dodan is a term Iranians use to refer to a properly cooked stew. It's a mandatory experience. You cannot serve a, a stew that is not jawof dade, which what it literally translates to is jawof dadan is to fall into place, to settle. Uh, what that looks like in a stew is when you have cooked it. Iranian stews are never served piping hot straight from the stove 
right into a platter or to a bowl, but rather you, you cook it properly, you turn it off, you keep the lid on and you just let it sit for five, 10, 15 minutes. What happens in that time, um, the oil that is used in the pan and the fat that is derived from either using chicken or lamb or beef, the oil surfaces to the top, which is such a signature for Iranian dishes. Right. Some dishes like pesenjun, which is a chicken and pomegranate and walnuts. Walnuts are full of fat, natural fat. So when that stew is jaw of dade, you can literally see a nice layer of oil on top. Right. And I and I distinctly remember as a kid uh, an incident where somebody was bragging about how good their stew is. And they say, oh, me, come over. I made pesenjun and it has that much oil on top. So that was a testament to their um, uh, skill set and to their ability to cook a proper stew that the oil has surfaced to the top. And that is called jaw of dadan. Right. And I think that's one of the most important concepts to me of, of Iranian cooking. It's not something that's fast. You really need right. time for it to all melt together and, and yes. present itself. Yes. And particularly when you're using fresh herbs, like what we are today, and we'll get to that and we'll talk more about it. The herbs need to be so cooked in that become the sauce, not just some things that float around the broth. So when, when you make a stew that you, the, the herbs are just separated and they're just floating around, that tells me that it didn't cook properly or uh, or long enough, or that you didn't saute the herbs long enough for it to literally get blended into uh, the body of the liquid to become the sauce. Right, I, I got distracted and I didn't add my meat in. You've added your meat? I added the meat, so we'll go right ahead. I'm gonna okay. give mine a stir. Okay. And I think mine has cooked for a couple of minutes, so now I can just add my water Put the lid and let the uh, water, onion, and beef cook for half hour all on its own. All right. Yeah. So some water time. And uh, how much beef did your recipe call for? Oh, I'll wait. How much? What did the recipe? Oh, how much uh, meat did your recipe call for? I can't remember. I typically use one pound of uh, animal protein for okay. four servings. And I personally, uh, when I cook, I I am not a vegetarian, but I usually put a little bit less than any recipe calls for, just because I want the flavor in there. But I actually prefer Iranian food um, with less meat. I I feel like the vegetables just do so much work that I don't need as much. So whatever yeah. your is. Yeah, I mean, when you think about one pound uh, of meat for four people, it isn't a whole a lot. Oh, so right. it serves that purpose, right? precisely. It flavors everything, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the centerpiece. And as we said, again, and every time I say it today, I just have to buckle to, to be reminded that the celery is the is the <laughs> celery. <laughs> How often do you ever get to hear that? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. Give it a stir and put the lid and just let it cook. And now I'm going to get ready for the herb and the celery part, but we'll wait till uh, Layla is caught up with us. Okay, I'll just have some tea. <laughs> and I have another question um, specific to me right now. So uh, we have a big freeze going on, so we can't go shopping. All of our grocery stores are closed where I'm in Texas right now. And so I had a certain amount of parsley that I didn't, your recipe calls for four bunches of parsley. There's a lot of parsley in this dish. I only have two bunches, but I do have I always have this collection of uh, dried herbs. So when I'm thinking about dried herb sources, I'm gonna have to supplement. What is kind of the conversion that I would use? Yeah. 
Yeah, so dry herbs are wonderful and they are well established and accepted in the Iranian cuisine. So dry herbs are never looked down upon. As a matter of fact, there are some herbs that I actually prefer the dried herb over the fresh, like mint to me, fresh mint is beautiful and it's so aromatic and we are using it in this dish. But kind of my own addition and signature to this, I also add a little bit of dried mint to it because it really just enhances the flavor. But to answer your question, I think about uh, for every cup of fresh herb, if you were to use, I would use about a third, third to half of a cup of dry. When you think about it, because the moisture is evaporated, the flavor is concentrated. So you need to at least half it, maybe even go by only using a third. Okay, wonderful. Somewhere around there. So what was the water that I have to put? How much water do I have to add in there? Put in about a cup and a half, two cups. Um, and that's a great point you bring up. You know, every time I teach a class, people measure everything right. and they put in. And at the end of the cooking, they're like, it's too watery or there's not enough water. Partially because our flames are all different. <laughs> our lids aren't always the right way, right? So it's always with Iranian stews, with Iranian khoresh, it's better to know what to look for at the end hmm. and adjust it accordingly. Right. So start with, you know, obviously you want some reference here. So I, I put in about a cup and a half at this stage. Okay. But, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I will feel free to adjust it as needed. Um, somebody asked about putting shambalile. Shambalile is a fenugreek leaves. This dish does not use um, fenugreek leaves. The one perhaps you might be thinking is the classic Iranian stew braise called orme sabzi, which is the more complex version of this dish that also doesn't have any celery in it. Right, which I thought about doing orme sabzi for this because it is, it's just very time consuming. It's not hard to make, but shambalile is something that you have to go to a specialty store to get. And so yes. I thought this would be a better one. There's no specialty ingredients besides the dried limes, which you could substitute regular lemon for. Yes, totally, totally. As a matter of fact, um, many don't use dried limes in making uh, khoresh karafs. They just use straight up lemon juice. Okay, so, so do I boil this and then put the lid on or what do I? Um, you would bring it to a gentle simmer once you okay. the bubbles break the surface, then put the lid on, lower the flame and you just, Long and slow does it. All right. Yes. Now comes celery. <laughs> right. The most, well, I, don't know, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Uh, just celery. Celery, as we know, carafs is just a delightfully crunchy, um, vegetable, but let's face it, you know, most, most of us in the US anyway, um, we eat it with peanut butter or we dip it into some kind of a dressing or it's a great little vehicle like hummus. It's a, uh, little slices of celery is a great spoon to pick up some yummier things such <laughs> as um, uh, hummus. So, in this case, we're not mixing it with anything else. We're just making this to shine. One way that vegetables come to their own and pick up more flavor is when you saute them. When you think about like roasted carrots, what happens when you roast carrots? It gets sweeter. Everybody loves butternut squash. When you roast butternut squash, it gets more tender and sweet. Same thing actually happens with celery, but we do have to take the time. Celery, as you know, is crispy, but it's also exceptionally watery. So when you saute it, it's one of my favorite sounds of just crackling sound. So um, no doubt you will hear it in Layla's kitchen and you will hear it in my kitchen in the background. We have to shout over the crackling of the celery. So we're going to saute the celery for a good 10, 15 minutes till we can get it aromatic, we can hear the sound, and we also see just a light, light browning take place. Yeah, can we then see we'll your celery? Work. Can we see it up close, how you cut it? 
I, I cut it non-traditional. I cut it diagonally. Um, <laughs> just, I, I, I went to a cooking school a long ago and diagonal cut became my favorite cut. And to this day, I just automatically go for diagonal. I literally cut this whole celery before I realized, oh no, I'm making Khoresh karafs. You don't make diagonal cut on Khoresh karafs. I contemplated, I'll, I'll confess, I contemplated going to the store, getting another batch of celery to cut it properly. <laughs> let's face it who are we kidding <laughs> a new trend which um our well our mutual friend i haven't met her in real life but she lives in seattle with you misha is on this call and she said please tease omidun about being a celery influencer so this is a perfect start for um being a diagonally cut celery influencer <laughs> there we go you heard it here first Khorish karas with diagonally cut uh celery is the new trend right <laughs> well, maybe not so uh, I'm going to uh, heat up my frying pan and add the oil and start cooking it. Have you covered what frying pan is with, with your students? No. Ah, frying pan is mahi tabe. That's right. Yeah. And mahi, actually, mahi tabe. Yeah. And I don't know... Uh, if the word mahi in the mahi tabe has any correlation to the fish, but I, so that one, that one is above my understanding of why it's called mahi tabe, but maybe somebody will know and they will share with us. That is funny. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, um, a lot of Iranian yeah. words we've talked about um, are combinations of different words together. Like ashpas khune is also a really good one. Ashpaz is a person who makes stew or porridge or ash really used to be the word for food in general. So person who cooks food is uh, ashpaz. Awesome. And yes. then ashpaz, the house of the cook. <laughs> yeah, I just love that. It's just yeah. so much around this, this reference to ash, like as you said, just an older term that referred to any cooked food. Now, of course, osh is its own series of dishes. And osh is often really difficult to describe to folks who are not Iranians. Yes. Is it a stew? Is it a stew? Right. It's confusing in because it's neither a soup nor a stew, but it's somewhere in between. I, I think of it never brothy, watery. So it's definitely on the thicker side of things. Right. But all of its own classifications of of a of many dishes in the cuisine. And it's a little confusing because there's also the Persian word soup. So it's not just like in English, the closest thing is soup. Or right. uh, there's a Canadian word, por, por, portage, portage. Yeah. I, uh, maybe an English word too. I don't know. Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I tell people I've never heard potage in Texas. Apparently, that's the clue. <laughs> <laughs> not quite porridge either. Porridge is its own thing too, and not right. definitely not broth. It's very thick. Yeah. It's really thick. Yeah, like somebody mentioned, Fanos. I think uh, Fanos John mentioned osh which is one of those classic, well-known osh dishes, which is lots of beans. There is. Lot, there are a lot of herbs again, and then there is reshte, which is the Farsi word, Persian word for uh, noodles. Right. Um, so ashi reshte is quite thick, and then has all kinds of yummy toppings on top of it. So uh, a bit time consuming, but well, well, well worth the effort and the investment in time. We'll have to do an ashi reshte. Is that for noodles? We'd make ashi reshte, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, all yeah. things herbs. Yeah. <laughs> in a few, in a couple months, we'll get together to do that as well. Okay, back to rogan zeytun, olive oil. Rogan zeytun. Oh, that's a lot of rogan zeytun. Maybe I need to add more. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Because I don't take the celery out. Yeah. As I add the herbs, some people take the celery out and then add the herbs. 
maybe I'm just a bit lazy. I just keep the celery in the pan and then I add the herbs. What, uh, let me add the celery and then I'll tell you uh, one of the main differences between Khorish Karafs, what we're making today, versus Hormasat Z. Oh, <laughs> what a cliffhanger. <laughs> So right now there's a lot of uh, controversy online over which one is better. <laughs> I mean, oh, I, I saw some of that. <laughs> it's a self-made uh, controversy, but <laughs> I mean, I think there's no question because especially since Hormisabzi just takes so much longer to make, it's not you know that yes. has to count for something. But <laughs> so. The key difference between the two, obviously, Hormasabzi does not have any celery in it. This is a celery stew, so of course it will have celery. So I treat the herbs as kind of like a supporting ingredient in Khorish Karat, mm -hmm. whereas in Hormasabzi, they are the key ingredients. Right. Meaning there is, uh, I use parsley, cilantro, fenugreek, uh, in Persian word, we say tare, which is essentially like a, a, a type of a chive that grows in Iran. Here in the U.S., green nira, if you go to an Asian market, green nira chives is a great replacement. Or you can go to Persian markets and buy dried tare. Right. Uh, and some people add spinach, some people don't. And then there's obviously, and of course, the shambadile, which is the fenugreek. The volume is larger in Hormisapsi. And I literally saute the, the herbs, the sabzi, for about a half hour. Okay. So you start with a big mound of green pile of yeah. finely chopped uh, herbs. And then you slowly and slowly and patiently and patiently saute them till they no longer look that vibrant green, but rather they look quite like a deep green brown shade. Some people take it almost to blacken. I don't, I don't necessarily go that far. Um, but when you do that, there is just such transformation with the scent that emanates from the pan yeah the flavor that changes as a result yes. with celery stew we don't need to do that we lightly saute them for about 10 minutes we don't right. take it to that level so that's one of the key difference between the two right wonderful point and yeah it is very <laughs> it's wild to see for warma sabzi you start with uh something <laughs> this big and you say okay you work hours and hours and hours and then you end up with this little pile. Yes. Right, right. Um, one of my son's uh, favorite food, and so, and he always, I always say, "What do you want to eat?" And he says, "Horma sabzi," and I just roll my eyes <laughs> and I say, "Your favorite food takes me three days to make." <laughs> You're, can you like pizza, please? <laughs> right, right. Um, in all the classes I've taught, I don't actually ever remember teaching horma sabzi. Wow. Uh, because it just is so complex, but I may be bringing that one to my next round of classes that I'm, that is the deadline to submit my menu is today. So after this, I'll be doing class proposal. And so maybe all this Gormis Z talk will be <laughs> the inspiration to actually put it in. If anyone's in Seattle, Omid does uh, in-person classes in Seattle. And I've heard lots of amazing, amazing yeah. things about those classes. Because like we said, you know, when we were talking about this uh, class, food is one of the fastest ways to really make a connection to a culture, right. yet from the heart, completely. Right. You right. don't have to know a language. You don't have to know. You can feel a culture through their food. Absolutely. It's a peaceful way of gathering, connecting, building a community. So every time I teach classes locally here, you know, I'm just delighted to see so many different folks from different cultures come in and obviously these days Iran is in the news and it's also an opportunity to educate people to share news of Iran and tell them you know who we are as Iranians and what we cherish and and what we love and how we love and and food is truly one of our love languages right we 
we want to feed everyone. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So. so I hadn't, I want to also mention, I hadn't prepped my um, parsley. So that's what I've been doing this whole time. And this is a technique. I know you can't really see because it's far away, but uh, I just hold my knife down and I just, that's the fastest way I do it. And then I gather again and then otherwise yes. it would take forever. This is my, <laughs> now I'm almost done with my parsley, which is not, not quite the four cups that we need. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be using my entire bag of uh dried parsley as well. Beautiful. Now, Layla is doing it the right way. I did it the lazy way, which <laughs> means I had such a busy day uh, with a, a visit to the dentist in, in the middle of it. So I uh, <laughs> put all my herbs in the food processor and I pressed the button. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if we had room for a food processor, I would also do that. but. <laughs> yeah, um, so let me take my herbs out of the fridge. Okay, I'm going to look into the, let's see, was turmeric the only seasoning for the meat at this point? Uh, we that also put, cool. did you put um, uh, namak salt on your onion? No? Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't either. No. Because, okay. No. So, no. one of our beliefs is adding namak salt too early will toughen the meat. So for me, namak goes in when everything is established, everything is built into the pan, then you add your salt and pepper, and then it continues to cook for another hour. Oh, so at this yeah. first stage, where it's just water, onion, and turmeric, I don't add any salt. Okay. The salt goes just a little bit later. Good to know. Yeah, um, well, that's not necessarily relevant in this dish, but in other dishes where the broth is supposed to be saffron colored or they're tomato based. One of our beliefs also about our, our cuisine, our dishes is the, how we preserve the color of the dish. So if a dish is supposed to be red, and if you serve it and it's darker than what it should be, right, that's a big no-no too. So what that means, like if a dish might have darchin, cinnamon, you don't add the cinnamon early in the stage in the cooking. You add it a little later ah. so that it doesn't cook and cook and darken the broth. Okay. So nuances, right? True. Well, so one thing I read in, you know, Tamara Adler's... Um book uh i forget what it's called right now but she said that at every stage the food should taste good so you should even taste your boiling water to see that it yeah. tastes good so is that the case here or do we just wait till the end like it all comes together in the end um there is nothing to taste per se i mean the broth is going to taste um a little oniony and a little beefy it should be okay but it will lack the salt because of the persian approach to not I adding see. the salt, okay. right? I have to confess, like what I learned in cooking school is in a little contrast in what I learned from Persian cuisine. Okay. I would have added all my seasoning at the beginning. Yeah, this is new to me. Yeah, but um, someone asked. some of the spices go a little later, particularly if they're going to darken the broth. Okay. That, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Yeah. So my celery is crackling in the background. And if I was to go look at it and I'll bring it forward so you can see, it's probably starting to blister a little bit and get a little caramelized and a little lightly golden. So let me check. Yes. I can hear it very nice. <laughs> So if I was to pick one and show you, stick your hand in a hot pan with oil. <laughs> Don't do this at home. <laughs> so you can, ooh, it's really hot. Um, <laughs> I thought I could do it, but not. So there's just a little coloring that is developing on the celery. I want to go just a little bit more because this is where celery begins to build its flavor within itself. And then we're going to add the herbs that then infuse flavor into it. 
Do you so know of any other? Do you know of any other dish that does celery like this, like in your cooking school? Sure. One of my favorite um, celery that I do is I call it celery, celery, celery soup, which is. <laughs> I know, very clever, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's a cream of celery soup. So I start with an onion, okay. and then I get a celery ac, the celery root, chop it up and saute that. Then I add the celery itself, saute that, season it with garlic, you know, whatever you like, uh, but primarily garlic and celery seeds. And then you add your broth. I typically make it vegan, so I may use vegetable broth. Mm -hmm. And I like it a bit on the creamy side, so I get a little bit of cashews, put it in a blender, nice. make a make a bit of a cashew cream, add it in there, put the lid. I typically do that in a pressure cooker because okay. pressure cooker has a way that it just really contains the flavor huh. and cook it for 15, 20 minutes and then get a handheld blender, puree it, top it off with uh, celery leaves. Wow. It is just celebration of celery. Misha's right, celery, uh, celery influencer right here. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm inspired. <laughs> it's, it's so simple, right? It's three, four yeah. ingredients, all root, stem, seeds, and leaves, right? right? So it truly uh, enhances every flavor of the, of the celery component that, that you add to it. Right. So that's one of my favorites. Wonderful. Otherwise, just dice it up, chop it up. It'll be it, an addition to other dishes. Like so when I make fried rice, there's carrots, there's celery, there is pepper, right? So it's just an item, but it's not shining on its own. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. My celery is where it needs to be. How's your celery doing? I think so. Yeah, it looks, yeah. Yeah, it's looking good. Perfect. I see you cut it properly, uh, <laughs> unlike me. <laughs> um, so the herbs, mm -hmm. I have my parsley and mint that I very lazily put it in my food processor earlier this morning okay. and I chopped it up and it's ready to go. So I will go ahead, add mine to the pan Initially, obviously, the celery is full of moisture, full of water of its own. So when I put it in my mahi tabe frying pan, I will have the heat a little on the higher side so that I can begin to evaporate some of the moisture that comes off this, uh, the herbs. But then you do have to lower the flame or else it could burn. So learn to moderate and be playful with these dials on your stovetop. <laughs> And another, it just dawned on me, another item that is different about Khorish Karafs versus Orma Sabzi. Orma Sabzi, the herbs is the sauce. There is no liquid per se, right? The, the sauce is this green herb. Whereas with Khorish Karafs, you can actually see more of the broth. So the herbs are there to blend it with the water, with the broth, but not they don't become the entirety of the of the sauce. Right. And yeah. when sh what at what point should I put my dried herbs in there now? I would put the dried herbs at the end. Okay. Once you have because if you add the dried herbs now, they could they could burn, potentially burn. Okay. okay. So first you want to get the moisture of the fresh herbs out. Okay. Give them a little extra flavor and life. And then at the last minute, add your dried mint and give it another minute or, or so of tossing. And then the whole thing with salt, pepper, and your form of acid. And we'll talk about the acid when we get ah, there. Wonderful. Yeah. And even my dried parsley, since I didn't have parsley, I should add that at the end as well? Yeah, I would. There's, there's no need to add it earlier. Okay. You want to focus on the fresh herbs to get them taken care of first, and then you add the dry. Sounds good. All right. So let's uh, taft 
the, the herbs and celery. Okay. And uh, Ariana asks, do we know what region of Iran Persia Cadax is from? Ah, that's a brilliant question. I don't know specifically. This is so well known um, that I don't think it nest. No doubt it has an origin that I don't know. But it isn't a very specific dish that only northerners or southerners eat it or eastern or western. Or rather, this is a, a well recognized dish that is eaten and consumed throughout Iran. Right. Versus there are absolutely specific dishes that come from regional uh, areas. But I don't, this is no longer the case with Khorish Karafs. Okay. And then Kayla says, we're adding fresh herbs to the celery. Yes, we did. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Let's do that. Yes. I don't know. Well, I know what how my kitchen smells, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that you're also experiencing this kind of a bit of a beef broth on the background and then just a lot of fresh herb with a little bit of celery scent in the air. So are you guys smelling um, it? Yes. Okay. I'm getting nods here <laughs> from my live audience. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So do you have a little applause sign that comes on and your audience does a round of applause? <laughs> applause. It works. I love it. I, I need love to get it. One. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> wholesome. I think so too. It really is a wholesome dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody know what we? Oh, we already answered that. Okay, a celebration. Celebration. <laughs> I love it. I'm just catching up with some of the um, comments here. Any favorite cookbooks or accounts that specialize in regional cuisine within Iran? Well, our favorite cookbook. Well, I speak for myself, and I'll and I'll have Layla obviously speak for herself. Uh, bottom of the pot is to me is beautiful food accessible food available food in other words you know it's it's written for you and me that live outside of iran so the ingredients are more accessible and that is a well used book <laughs> i love it <laughs> i thought so about getting another one but it'll just the same thing will happen it's not the, qual the quality of the book is very good i've just used it a lot <laughs> i use so that is one that I think if you're new to the Persian cuisine, uh, I think that is one that I would absolutely recommend. Also, our beloved Najmie um, has a cookbook. She came out with a book uh, about three, four years ago called Cook in Iran. Yeah. Which, which and that's an old one. Uh, she has about 10 books out. But that one, Cook in Iran or Cooking in Iran, something like that, uh, is all about regional food of, of Iran. So it is a bit of an encyclopedia. It is quite thick. Um, and I have made many of dishes that I've never heard before. And I just love learning and being exposed to it. Colette, I can put that on um, the website. But I also want to mention, uh, since Omid probably won't, he has a fantastic blog, which I use all the time to cook. And um, it's also like bottom of the pot, very accessible uh, recipes. And you should all have received the recipe for this dish that we're cooking. That's Omid's own recipe. And he has a very interesting story. We have a podcast that we recorded together where he told me his entire journey to uh, coming into Persian cooking. And so I think that one thing that makes him very unique is that he kind of veered away from Iranian culture for a really long time, went to cooking school, um, learned all the, you know, Western cooking, vegetarian cooking, and then came back to Iranian cooking. So he has a very interesting lens and can translate. Uh, he's a good cultural liaison. It can translate the recipes very nicely for uh, for us. <laughs> so I really appreciate his, rec his recipes a lot. And like his name says, the Caspian chef, his family is from the Caspian region of Iran. So it's very, it's some of the recipes are very, uh, specific to that region. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Leila John. Okay. Yes, um, cooking has been quite a journey, not just through the cuisine and um, 
a cooking aspect of it, but really a return to uh, my roots. You know, as you mentioned for many decades, I just veered off. I rarely, if ever, spoke Persian. I wasn't eating Iranian food. I was too busy not being an Iranian. Um, and until, you know, I think at some point you get a little older and you forget who you are and you have this deep longing to, to know where do you belong? Who are you? Where do you come from? And in that pursuit, it really just brought up a lot of stuff for me, a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions, a lot of memories, good, bad, and the ugly of it all. I think many of us Iranians could could tell quite a tale about our life experiences. Mm -hmm. And so food has just become that journey that, that I now take other people on with me. Uh, and that's why I love I love teaching classes because it just you sit with strangers and then you become friends at the end of the class because there is that common point, commonality of um, belonging, community, appreciation for good food, um, relating to another person's life experiences. So food really became a great catalyst for that for me. That's wonderful. Well, yeah. we only have a few minutes left, so I think we oh, have to kind of talk about the end of it. And the... Ooh, All right. Cool. So my sabzi has cooked down, and I'm going to stay with it for another minute or so. Then literally I'm going to add the whole thing to the pot with water and the beef, add my salt pepper, and then if you have these dried limes, you can use them. What I have done, I typically poke them, and you have to do this very carefully because they're really hard. Poke them carefully, or, or if you like, if you want more flavor coming out of it, you can actually cut them in half. And that's what they look like. They're not terribly appealing looking, but they're just magical in the way that they add such a depth of flavor to the dish. So they are limes. They look like beef when you serve it to people that are not familiar with the cuisine. Oh, yeah. Warn them <laughs> that this is going to pucker you up when you take a bite of it. I like to eat them, but in smaller pieces. Yes. And should I add my dried uh, parsley yes. now? Okay. Yes. This is the time. And I will add my dried mint. Okay. And this dried mint was grown outside of Tehran in city of Karaj by my Khale Munir, oh. my aunt Munir, oh, nice. that my mom brought from her last visit. So, you know, you smell this food, you smell this dried mint, and it really does have a way of transporting you to a land, to a culture so far away. Um, so I'm going to add my dried mint next. Okay. And um, Colette asks, do you speak mainly Farsi now? So Colette, uh, if you listen to our uh, conversation, if you listen to our podcast conversation, uh, it is answered <laughs> in that in that podcast when Omid used to, he started doing lives with uh, people in Iran and you'd have to take out a dictionary and just look up words there. <laughs> so it's been a journey. It, yes, it really has been. Coming to the US and having to learn English and looking up English words to translate. Fast forward 40 years later, as I was doing these lives and words like to knead a bread, I, I never learned that term. Or <laughs> like the, the word for oregano, I, I just had no idea. So I would actually, well, I no longer have dictionaries. I have my Google translator. <laughs> I, <laughs> right. I would look these up. I would have to look these up so that I don't, you know, one of the, I, I speak Farsi a bit awkwardly sometimes and clearly with a bit of an accent, but I really wanted not to switch back and forth between too many English and, and Persian. So um, it was definitely a learning experience for me. <laughs> well, we only have a minute left. Polly says this has been so late. Polly, can you stay up until, is it one in the morning over there right now? <laughs> Are we keeping you up very late? Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for staying with us. And uh, thank you everybody for staying with us. Um, I very nearly ate the limes off the, off Kush the first time I thought about the people. It happens a lot. 
Oh, Polly says it's midnight, actually. That's a little bit better. But, <laughs> and Colette says, let's do it again. What do you say, Omid? Should we do this again? <laughs> I'm game. I'm game. This is always a fun thing for me. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And, and he mentioned that he has khorsh ghaymeh that he's cooked already and an abgush. And uh, <laughs> so there's a lot going on. I do want to mention, let me write down the Caspian chef. Um, the best place I think to follow him is on Instagram. Yeah. Cassie yes. Um, so follow Thank him you. there and you'll see all of his recipes. They're absolutely wonderful. I am Chai in Conversation. Uh, so be with me as well. I'm going to um, make more cooking videos and have these words on there um, for you guys to learn. And someone said, can we watch this again later? Yes, you can rewatch this as many times as you want. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again <laughs> learn something new every time uh we'll we'll go over we'll have these vocab words for you to see on our instagram page um and for those of you who are in the chai and conversation boot camp uh we'll be talking about this and having a special uh little presentation about the words we've learned and i invite you all to cook this dish and tag both omid the caspian chef and chai and conversation so we can see what you made Absolutely. I will post mine when it's finished. Wonderful. And is there anything else you want to add, Omid John, before we disconnect the call? Chayli, chayli, chayli mamnoon. Mamnoon as Shoma and mamnoon as everyone who followed along with us. This is a wonderful group. Thank you for participating, your wonderful questions, and for being with us. And Todafe Dad. Todafez. <laughs> well done, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Oh.